Well, I'd just like to start by asking how many people in here have had COVID before? Show of hands. Most of the room. I'm going to ask a more personal question. How many people have had a loved one that has died from COVID? Wow. Okay. Let's say that's 40% or so of the room. I would ask another question that's probably a bit too personal, but uh, we'll let that one go. But it's evident that COVID-19 has touched everybody's lives in the room today. And my story is uh, unique in some ways. Um, everybody has a testimony about what they've gone through. But I'll just give you a little backdrop. Around Christmas, a little bit before Christmas, I'm going out to the family ranch. And as I'm going out to the ranch, it's just something I love to do. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God. I like to go out on the property. There's a seven-acre lake, a five-acre lake, and uh, Bo's never done any manual labor in his whole entire life. Amen. So, so I like to, you know, some of the roads wash out from time to time, and there's always something to do on a ranch. And I was out there during this period of time. I had a few hundred pounds, a few hundred bags of 60-pound bags of concrete. And I was preparing some of the washed out road, buckets of rock, pouring it out and fixing the road a little bit. Uh, just having a good time, enjoying God's creation. And we have a tradition within the Chin family that we've continued on since my brother has passed away. But we always get together at, uh, at Brother Tom's house for Christmas Eve. He always loved having everybody over on Christmas Eve. A huge feast. Um, we have a white elephant gift. Fun time doing that. But as I got up from the meal, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong with my body. I began to have chills. I began to have cold sweats. Uh, my father-in-law, wife, and daughter here were with me. But I'm Mr. Tough Guy. I hung in there and Stayed throughout the night, and as soon as uh, we got home, I went straight to bed. And my wife, she went and got uh, a test kit from the, the drugstore, COVID-19 test kit. It made everybody feel better because I tested negative. So we thought, you know, maybe it's some type of a virus or something. I'm going to double down on my vitamins, you know, I'm going to drink plenty of fluids and do all those things, and uh, I thought that would be good. The very next day is Christmas Day, and we always have uh, my wife's family comes over to our house. We had a house full of people. I spent the entire day in bed. I could hear all the festivities going on out there and the laughter and carrying on. And I'm sitting there just wiping perspiration off my head, chills, uh, putting an extra blanket on at times. And uh, thinking this is not going the right direction. But uh, as stubborn as I am, I refuse to go to the ER. Um, I actually waited four more days. I went for the first time on December 28th, and all this started was December 24th of 2021. When I finally relented, I went to the ER. The very first thing they did, they gave me a COVID test. You test positive, you got COVID-19, the Delta variant. They put me on some medication, some antibiotics. They sent me home cough medicine and uh, they said you know if you're not feeling better in a couple of days come see us well I was back in a couple of days I was having more difficulty breathing my strength I felt like my strength was leaving me still could take my brother but that's another story uh, <laughs> But I, I felt like I was getting weaker and weaker. I, I wasn't going this direction. I was going downhill. And so two days later, I find myself for the third time at the ER. 
and I'm hooked up to oxygen this time. The same pattern they tell me, you know, give me some medicine, go home, rest. You know, you've got some oxygen. I think my oxygen at this point in time was around 80. Uh, normal is 98, so not, not good. So here we go again. It's the fourth visit to the ER clinic. And I am so glad, so glad that I had a doctor this time and he saw in me, he saw in me what was going on in me, what he experienced the year earlier. He just didn't check me off and send me down and put me in a room because at this time ever, it, they were just overwhelmed. There were patients flooded. The hospitals were full with COVID patients. People were dying left and right. We've had colleagues in our office that died from it, friends that died from it. But this particular doctor took time and he said, Ken, the only way you're leaving here is by ambulance. He said, I'm going to personally arrange for you to get a room at the hospital. I said, I'm not fighting that. So I knew how bad I was. So it took about seven, eight hours for him to get me a room. During this time, he comes back about every hour. You know, he's got other patients, but he's coming back about every hour. And he's giving me little five minute, little tidbit stories of what he did when he was, had his bad COVID experience. He began to tell me that he actually checked himself in. Uh, he went to another town and checked himself in, put himself on a vent. And as he said, I was one of the, the lucky few who came off a vent. I believe he was on the vent for 12 days, but it took him like nine months to recover to get back to where he could treat patients. And he would tell me a little bit about his recovery process, about he bought a Peloton bike, and when he first bought that, you know, he didn't want to go out to the gym, but he could just barely make strides on that bike, the walking machine, and you know, just slowly, slowly, just his health began to slowly, slowly improve. So I really want to give him credit and, uh, for stepping in and just drawing a line and say, no more of this. You know, you're, just, you're in dire need. So I find myself uh, waiting there. Um, I'm on oxygen. And... Finally, a room opens up, and, and sad to think, you know, probably someone had to die for me to get a room in that hospital. So I go by ambulance there at the hospital, and, you know, uh, my first days in the hospital is really what I want to focus on. Um, they were just so critical to everything that happened uh, and to the testimony of what God did and how God manifested himself. It wasn't long I was in the hospital and I had four doctors confronting me, doctors and internists. And these doctors, I was in a very weakened condition. I'm on oxygen. I'm very frail. I, I mean, I'm barely, I think I was on a wheelchair. By this time I can walk, have no energy. I lost 32 pounds of muscle. Brief period of time. So these doctors are trying to convince me, look, your, your, your chance here is to go on this vent. You don't know how sick you are. We're trying to help you. Let us help you. And just one right after another, you know, you don't, you're not in the right frame of mind. You're wasting precious time. Sign this DNR and go on this vent and let's, get, let's start taking care of this. And I really felt like, uh, not that I'm here to give medical advice, but I just felt like that this was not for me. And I, what I had read and what I had experienced with friends and loved ones, uh, I told them, as all this is going on, and this is a bit confrontational, 
I said, what I have read and researched tells me that only 12% of the people who go on ventilators live to come off of it. And I said, I don't like those odds. I said, if I'm going to die, I'm going to go out and have the awareness that I have. And I made that choice. Whether that's the right choice for someone else, that's not my decision. I'm just telling you, for me, I felt like I was making the right choice for Ken Chin. And so as they began to see what a stubborn man I am, um, one by one, they left to go treat some patients who were more cooperative and who would fall in line with their protocol and recommendations. Shortly after this, I find myself being rolled down to the bottom floor, rolled in my bed, pushed down the end of the hall to a room all by myself, all alone. My wife couldn't be with me. There were no visitors allowed. This began to happen around 10.30 at night. And I thought to myself, how did I get here? How did I, as I sat in that room all alone, how did I get here? How did things fall apart just so quickly? And so I, my, I had a whole shift. I had a whole shift in my spirit. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew if I went to sleep, if I closed my eyes and just rolled over, that I was going to die. Since I wouldn't go on a vent, they hooked me up to a BiPAP machine that forces air into your lungs. And I'm in this room all alone, and I knew my only hope was in the Lord. Amen. I felt like the doctors had kind of dismissed me, and because of me not going down their path, so my whole attention just shifted to God. And I began to call out to God because I knew my, 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 my hope and my being was just in God alone. And I, I began to think about Jacob, how in Genesis chapter 32, it says that Jacob wrestled with God all night long. It wasn't a five-minute prayer that he said over food. God bless this food. No, there was an intensity, there was a passion, there was life and death, what he was facing. He thought he was going to get taken out by Esau the next day. He was going to die. His family was going to die. There was this sense of urgency and travail. So he wrestled with the angel. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And I felt I was facing death. And I was in this same predicament. All of these scriptures that I've known for 40, 50 years, all of these Bible stories but just, just flood up through my spirit and in my mind. And I begin to, to think of, of the Psalms that says, says, God, God, oh God, you are my ever-present help. God, you're my ever-present help in my time of need. God, I need you right now. I don't need you tomorrow. God, I'm struggling for breath. Each and every breath, I felt like I was just between death and eternity, fighting to hang on. Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26 says, My flesh and my heart faileth. And I was crying out, God, my body is shutting down, Lord. My flesh, my heart are failing. But God, you're the strength of my heart. Quicken me, God. Make me alive. 
I begin to think about other desperate prayers of Hannah in the Old Testament. Hannah was desperate. It said she was weeping. She was strong tears, emotion, crying out to the Lord for deliverance, for God's intervention in her life. So much so with the tears and the shaking that was going on that the the dumb priest Eli thought she was drunk in the morning. There was such a passion and travail. I've heard it said before that God does not answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. Look out through the Bible and study the Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. God does not answer prayer. Oh God, He answers desperate prayer. And this is where I found myself. This is what I was at. Clinging to the Word of God. Clinging to hope. Just one breath at a time. And my prayer was, God, God, be merciful to me. God, let me live to see my daughter, to see my daughter get more established in the faith. God, let me live to see my daughter become more mature and more independent. God, spare my life. Let me be here for her as the father is crying out, praying a prayer over his only child. I knew God would hear my prayers. I didn't know if He would answer them the way I wanted Him to. I began to think about the Hebrew youth. Again, these passages of that death seem imminent. The three Hebrew youth, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were about to get tossed into the fiery furnace. But at the last minute, they were tossed in. They were thrown into the fire. At the last minute, God sent the fourth man, the angel, to deliver them out and to spare their lives. And that's what I was praying. God, be merciful to a sinner like me. Spare my life, O Lord. God, give me another chance. I began to think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. How that there's this medical terminology. Maybe this nurse in the background can pronounce the word. I can't. But Jesus sweat great drops of blood. Such was the intensity of Him praying for us as He's fixing to be going to the cross, taking the sin of the world upon Himself. There was such intensity and a struggle And then blood is actually pouring from his veins. And I'm not trying to be a saint here. Many of you know me for years. You know, my mind goes all over the place. You know, it's hard for me to pray 15, 20 minutes at a time. But when your life is on the line, when death and eternity are upon you, and you have this will to live, to rise up in you. That's where I was at. I'm like the disciples. Jesus said, hey, man, can't you hang out with me for one hour? Can't you pray with me for an hour? That's Ken Chin. I'm right there with him. So this is all going down and again, all of these scriptures and Bible stories. You know, I begin to think about Jesus, our high priest. How Jesus knew, Jesus knew how I felt. He could feel my weakness by infirmities what I was going through. He had gone through it for us. As all these different passages would flow through me, you know, I began to settle in uh, uh, 
just, just on Romans 8, 11, it talks about if the Spirit, if the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He will quicken, which means translate, He will make alive your mortal bodies. And I just begin to say that to myself over and over. God, God, let your Holy Spirit just quicken my body, God. It, it's, it's failing. It's shutting down, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit come upon me, God. Quicken me. Strengthen me. And I just, I, I hung out on that scripture probably about 30 minutes, just processing it and, and praying it and meditating on it. struggling to breathe. And as I did, I felt this quickening in my body. I felt this surge of energy. And it was like someone had taken a plug and just plugged it into me. And I just felt like electricity was flowing through my body. And I mean, I am just totally washed out. So this encouraged me. You know, this encouraged me to continue on and to continue to fight through the night as I felt that quickening of the Holy Spirit and, and, and just it gave me the strength to, to continue to battle, to continue to pray, to continue to call upon the Lord. After a period of time, I began to feel that energy just leave my body. And I began to feel weak and desperate again. And just something just rose up in me to just continue to fight. The will to live, to call out upon God. I was like the leper on the side of the road. God, have mercy on me. God, touch me. Everybody else is telling him to shut up. We don't want to hear you. But you know, through his persistence, through his prevailing, God healed him. Just like the unjust judge, the story of the unjust judge. You know, Jesus talked about the judge. He didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. So what? He didn't care about anybody out there. But he said, because this woman keeps coming to me over and over again. I don't fear God and I sure don't fear any of y'all. Because of her persistence, I'm going to grant her what she wants. Not that God is an unjust judge, but Jesus was teaching us about persistent, prevailing prayer. Something we don't know very little about. So during this time frame, I mean, I'm just... I, I was struggling so much like my spirit, I, I'm... You're so in, in tune with the spirit realm and, and, and the flesh and, and eternity and death. And I had this heightened awareness of what's going on. At times I felt like my spirit was about to come out of my body. And I was fighting so hard like, God, no, God, I want to no, God, I want to live. I want to live, God. And just a constant battle. It's like I could see things happening from here looking down upon myself, struggling. I could see myself struggling in the Spirit. And the next verse I really just I drilled down in and I held on to was Romans 8.26. And it talks about the Spirit of God, how the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that words we cannot even utter. And so as your mind kind of comes to an end, as you're thinking about all these scriptures, and I'm sitting there and I'm just groaning in the spirit. I'm going, oh, oh God, 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 be, be with me, God. Be merciful to me, God. Be attentive to my prayers. Just, this is coming out of my spirit, uh, just this 
deep intercession and travail, at times I felt like my insides were just going to burst out of my body. It was so intense. But I just kept doing that. I was just like, God, oh, oh, God, 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 be with me, God. Be with me, Lord. I need you. God, I need you now. And as I was in that mode, I looked down at my arms and my body. I opened my eyes up. And I looked down at my arms and my body and was covered with this white frosted light. This light was unearthly. It was, it was moving. It was alive. It was like, like particles moving within it and not just static like you see a light up here. And I thought, oh my gosh. My reaction was, oh my God, I'm fixing to die. I've heard all these stories, you know, where, of course, I was alone, but where loved ones are around someone, a, a godly saint, and, you know, they're on their deathbed, and, you know, aunt and uncle here, and everybody's around them, and they look up and they say, do you see it? You see what I see? I see heaven. I see Jesus. I see angels. And, and nobody else sees a thing. They're just... Like, what? He's hallucinating here or something. But they see this and then they fall back and breathe their last and their spirit leaves their body and they go on to be with the Lord. And so, from that beginning, my, my concern of death, that God was not going to answer my prayers, after a couple of minutes, I began to become fascinated by the warmth, by the glow, by the peace and the love that I felt. Once I got over that initial fear, and I can still, I'll see this the rest of my life in my mind, looking down at my arms and seeing this bathe in this glory of God, the Spirit of God, was just so supernatural and so special it, it, again, it gave me strength. God was giving me another manifestation, just like He had done earlier, the quickening of the Holy Spirit. And we know from the Scripture that God is light. God is light. We, we, we don't emphasize that part so much. We emphasize God is love, 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 1, 5 says God is light. Light is part of the very essence of God's being. So this went on for 20, 30 minutes, seeing things in this spiritual realm that were just uh, comforting and beautiful and um, knowing that I was not alone, that God was with me. I begin to think about the prophet Elisha. He says, they're going to attack from the south. He gets word to the king, line everybody up on the south, get the military ready. The army sees them, they can't attack. This happens again and again. So much so that the enemy king says, I've got a traitor in my midst. Let's find out who it is. Let's execute him and get rid of him. And the men there said, Oh, king, that's not so. But there is a man in Israel who hears the words you speak on your bed while you're making your battle plans. And he says, Let's go snuff out that guy's life. Uh, you know, he's more powerful than the whole army. Because he's dialed into the spirit realm. He's dialed into God. So the whole army is coming after this one man. They're coming after one man. As they arrive there, 
the servant says, oh my gosh, Elisha, Elisha, we're fixing to die. You know, it's been nice knowing you. We've had a good ministry together, but it's all over now. Elisha walks out, says a simple prayer. He says, God, open my servant's eyes that he might see. And God opened his eyes that he could see what Elisha was seeing all the time. That God is with us. God is for us. God desires to manifest himself to us in greater ways than we've ever experienced before. You know, it's just a matter of if we will be still and know that he's in God, that he, if we will take the time to draw aside to have these type of experiences. So after a period of time, this light disappears. And, you know, I'm having these high-low spells here. And I begin to get desperate again. You know, I'm calling out to God. I just felt like I had to make it to the morning light. I had to make it to the morning. I had to fight through. I had to live. So I'm just in deep, deep prayer again. Just groaning in, in the scriptures and uh, pleading with God. And, and I heard this voice. So I heard this voice, and the last thing I expect is to hear the voice of God on my deathbed. The last thing I expect is the Holy Spirit to speak a word to me. And I heard this just ringing. It was, you, you shall live and declare the glory of God. And it was just like my body, it was just like, ringing in my body. My body and my mind were processing this. And then I heard a second time, you shall live and declare the glory of God. And just for good measure, like God does sometimes in the scripture to get through to stubborn people like me, I heard it a third time more powerful. You you shall live and declare the glory of God. And it's one thing to know the Bible and to memorize the scripture, and I do all that, and I encourage you to do it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Know all these Bible stories on and on. But when God speaks, that is called a rhema word of God. When the particular situation you're in, when God has a direct, specific word that he needs to get to you for that very moment, you know, and I believe God gave me that word. And I said that to myself, struggling to hang on. I said that to myself a hundred, a thousand times the rest of the night. God, you said, I will live and declare the glory of God. That was like a lifeline, like we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that just built up the faith within me as weak as I was and as hard as I was struggling to, to breathe and to stay in my body and to, to not die. So I'm hanging on and hanging on. I'm just waiting. And... It was probably 30 minutes or so later, and I hear, I hear that rattling on that glass door in the hospital room. I heard it. I started hearing that, and, and as soon as that nurse slid that door open, pulled that curtain back, man, I felt like I was on a rocket ship. I felt like this surge of... The Spirit of God just came upon me and overwhelmed me. And even in my weakened state, I felt like I was just bursting with the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord had overcome me, had overcome my strength. I felt like I had won the battle. I had prevailed. I began to think about the children of Israel who it seemed like certain death. 
mountains on both sides, waters in front. The mighty Egyptian army is coming after them furiously and fiercely. And they knew there was no way out. God parted the waters. They walked over on dry ground. And it was like to them and what I felt like in my spirit, it was like a new beginning. They had crossed over into something differently. Egypt was behind them. And, and I felt like somehow or another I had just crossed over. I had, I had defeated death today. I began to think about Lazarus. You say, oh, Ken, you didn't die. I know I didn't. But I felt like I came about as close as you could. I began to think about Lazarus and, and how God restored him and gave him new life. And that's what I felt. I felt like new life. I felt like I'd been given another chance that, that God had restored me. Uh, the psalmist again, David said, Our soul, our soul is escaped out of the death trap. Our soul had escaped out of the death trap. You know, like the bird had escaped. And... Another passage that I thought about immediately, I felt like God had pulled me out of the lion's den of death like Daniel. God had just pulled me out of the lion's den of death. And I just was so overjoyed and so just ecstatic. I mean, if I could have gotten up and danced, I would have. Such was the power and the urge to Praise God, and a smile came across my face. It was just so glorious, and the nurse comes in and looks at me and thinks, yeah, the guy's still with us. What are we going to do with him now? <laughs> you know, never said a word. And so I was uh, spent. I did not get a miraculous healing you know, I did not get a miraculous healing. And that was not even my prayer. My prayer was, God, just allow me to live. Allow me to live. And so I spent a month at the hospital. And it was hard going. It was a fight still. But in my spirit, I felt like I was going to live. Now, you know, medically speaking and and things, you know, they're, they're x-raying my lungs every other day and saying, pointing up there at the chart saying, you're not looking good. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, yeah, oh, golly, that's terrible. And I got to where I just wouldn't look, you know, just listen to them, try to tune them out, you know. Uh, but, you know, the struggle from their own, I mean, I would be in my hospital bed and uh, I would try to move my feet an inch and I'd try to move my shoulders I moved my feet a little bit. I'm just trying to get to my recliner to sit to where I could eat. By the time I got there, I was like, whew, whew, just completely wiped out and exhausted. It take me a while to get my strength and my precious, loving wife. I was so weak. I could not even feed myself. She fed me for three weeks. Sometimes she thought she was cute and funny. She would take, yeah, she would, she would take the fork or the spoon and, you know, like we were feeding our two-month-old daughter. Here comes the choo-choo train. <laughs> Open wide. You know, but it brought a smile to my face. It, uh, you know, laughter does good. The laughter, the proverb says, and she did so much to care for me. Uh, I wouldn't be alive without her. And she's uh, just superwoman. She's so compassionate. And she wrote a chapter in the book, and so did my daughter. And... I am sitting there fighting for my life, not thinking, okay, it's January the 4th. It 
January the 4th is the one year anniversary where we lost Mamaw to COVID. And so my wife's plans changed radically. She was going to go put fresh flowers on the gravesite. She was going to break out the photo books and spend time thinking about all the great memories with Ella Ruth and Mama and I called her E.T. What a godly woman. What a godly woman and what a blessing she was to our family. But here she is, from her perspective, she's turning on the the fight herself, saying, oh my gosh, I've lost my mother a year ago. I'm fixing to lose my husband on the same day. And initially, she had a struggle, but she pulled herself together quickly, knowing that that would do no good. She began to call people that are prayer warriors She began to call people that she knew that could count on them, that can touch the throne of God, that are not, that they're doers of the word and not hearers only. People who get on their knees and plead for the Lord to do something. She did not want to lose me and didn't want her to lose me. And then my precious daughter. This was her last semester at university. She only had, was it 10, 12 hours? Not, not even a full load, 10, 12 hours, and she would graduate. And So she had a struggle herself. Was, You know, I don't want to go back. I want to take a semester off. I want to be here for my dad. But through my wife convincing her and my brother, he does have a couple of good traits. <laughs> I think, doesn't, doesn't he? A couple, a couple, okay. <laughs> but they, they convinced my daughter just to, uh, to go back and to finish up saying, that's what dad would want you to do. He would want you to go finish. You've come this far, finish it. So she graduated in May from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. Just a a great accomplishment. We're so proud of her. and, And just, there was just so many other God stories Wow, I got three minutes. He told y'all we were going till two, didn't he? <laughs> so two. You can, anybody can leave when they want to. And if people start doing this, to, to me, that's the symbol. Keep going, brother. <laughs> keep, 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 just keep, keep throwing it. <laughs> keep going. All right, praise the Lord. I love it. Well, I'll just share just a few other brief uh, testimonies that we had in the hospital that that I felt like God had done something. Was um, I had a nurse come in, a new nurse on my night shift. You know, I'm about two and a half weeks into this, and she comes in and she has my chart. She's trying to get up to date. First time for her to see me. You you know what I'm talking about, don't you? She's got it. She's got her thing. She's going, hmm, hmm. Okay, hmm, okay, hmm. And I was fixing to go, huh, too. You know, I just, okay, what, what? And she said these words to me. She said, Mr. Ken. She said, you beat the COVID two-step. I thought, okay. I'd never heard that phrase before. She explained it to me. She said, it's a a phrase the frontline workers have for people that have two steps left before they die. 
She said, when I look at your chart and see where you're at, where you've come to, you beat the COVID two-step. And it was so sweet, a rejoicing time. You know, she was like an angel to me at that time. Uh, is she, she was a believer, a Christian, a woman of God. And so I told her a little bit of the story that I've shared with you. And she said, by all indications, God delivered you, you know. So that was really a special moment for me that, to be able to, uh, to have that special time with her. And uh, I had great care. I had great nurses. I think of uh, the ones that were involved. You know, it was, uh, I think God put them in my path to take care of me. A lot of them I could didn't like some of the things, and I might have an issue with them one or two times, so, you know, but we got that straightened out too. I thought they were pushing me too hard. I didn't, hey, wait a minute, man, you know, I almost died here, you know. Give me, a few more, give me a few more days before we do this. But they knew what it took and, um, to get me there. And um, I had a pastor that sent me a note. I'm going to close with this. My wife's getting restless, so I know, you know, I, I, I have to go home to her. You know what I'm talking about, Craig? <laughs> Not, you know, I can tell. I get that look. Right, Ann? Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. I better shut it down, Rocky. It's, it's, I'm closing, okay? I'm closing. I love it. Yeah, you're my cheerleader. I love that. This is my first closing. I've got five more. But I had a dear friend who's a pastor who sometimes God speaks to him, and he will be out of my life for a period of time, and then all of a sudden, bam, he sends me something. And he sent me this message, not knowing, you know, he just knew that I was sick. He had no clue, no carnal knowledge the way he could have known any of this. And he sent me this text message. He says, you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed and won the victory. But God gets all the glory. And he said, I'll struggle with that for about 20 minutes. He said, I didn't want to say it that way. He said, I thought, no, God, I'm, maybe I'm not hearing this. He said, I wanted to say... You have wrestled with God. God got the victory, and God gets all the glory. But he said, I couldn't write it that way. And to me, it was just so powerful because we are co workers with God and the plan. We're co workers, we have our part to do. You know, I could have just rolled over and died. But we have to fight the battle. God told the nation of Israel, look, I've given you the land. This land flowing with milk and honey, grapes, all that. Now go take it. He just didn't blow on the people and they all died. You go in and take it. You got a little battle to do out here. We quote that well-known scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do it through Christ's power strengthening me. You know, there's that co-laboring again. God provides the anointing. You know, God shows up, but God works through you. He works through you. He's not going to do it by himself. And if he can't find us, he's going to find somebody else to do his will and purpose. So I think that's so key and so critical. You know, we have to do the battle. We have to fight. 